This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is the all-in-one learning platform with thousands of video courses ready for you to take on any kind of skills you can think of. One of the great benefits of Skillshare is that the courses are pretty high quality. No courses from British 12-year-olds with gamer headset mics here. High quality professional productions. In the last ad, I told you guys I was having trouble with my personal productivity system. Luckily, since then, I have resolved most of those problems, but now I'm trying to be more efficient in other projects, such as with my video editing. And so right now, I'm looking at another course from Jordy Vanderput on Skillshare about creating motion graphics templates with Adobe After Effects. With this, I can create a bunch of on-screen materials that I can use for future videos to spice them up and even speed the process up in editing. But there are plenty of other courses on Skillshare available. So I'm certain if you're looking for whatever skill you need, you can find something here for it. And I have a special offer for you. The first thousand people to click that promo link in the description or in the pinned comment will get a free month trial of Skillshare Premium. Watch as many courses as you want and, if the service is right for you, sign up for a whole year. It is a really great value and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, but now, back to the history. When American troops first arrived in Japan after its formal surrender, they encountered a country devastated by war. Months of firebombing followed by two atomic blasts in Hiroshima and Nagasaki had taken their toll on the infrastructure and morale of the Japanese. Hiroshima, seen from the air after the atomic bomb blast that virtually erased this city of 340,000 people from the earth. As far as the eye can see, stretch scenes of desolation and ruin. Four square miles leveled by one bomb, the product of allied science and a climactic answer to the terror and aggression let loose upon the world by Japan. Nagasaki, target for the second atomic bomb. Just three days after Hiroshima, this explosion was concentrated in an area of one square mile, destroying its selected terrain even more completely. Osaka, city of three million, is burned out by fire bombs that raised scores of square miles. Scenes like these leave no doubt that Japan was thoroughly beaten before the atomic bomb. I mean, after all that devastation, it seemed unlikely to everyone, especially outsiders, that Japan could ever recover from this. But they did. It didn't just recover, it exploded and thrived, and today we drive Japanese cars, play Japanese games, and watch Japanese cartoons. The explosive economic growth ran against everything economists knew and believed about economics. This is the story I want to tell you, which is a smaller part of the story of the Cold War and Project MAD, a massive collaboration of over 20 history YouTubers all making videos about the Cold War. You can find the playlist at the end screen or down in the description below. To fully understand this story, we need to take a quick tour of Japan before World War II. Under the Tokugawa shogunate, Japan was isolated from the rest of the world for over 250 years. But the isolation was broken by the expedition of U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry, whose state-of-the-art squadron of ships arrived in Edo Bay in July 1853, and through the art of bigger gun diplomacy, forced Japan to open up its ports to American ships. This triggered a set of dominoes that resulted in the shogunate losing power to the emperor and Japan modernizing in order to better resist European colonialism. This desire to resist colonialism eventually led them to colonizing other countries themselves, creating their own empire across the Pacific. They invade China, which results in the European powers gradually cutting off trade with Japan. Japan tries to reverse parry them by attacking the Europeans and Americans across the Pacific, but it backfires. By the end of the war, much of their industry is destroyed and they are occupied by foreign powers, the exact thing they tried to avoid. Admiral Halsey's gigantic third fleet steams at full strength through Japanese home waters on a mission of destiny. The United States had two initial goals for its occupation of Japan. With Japan defeated, General of the Army Douglas MacArthur as Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers had the heavy responsibility of transforming that nation into a peaceful, stable democracy, despite a tense and critical Far Eastern situation. They believed they could demilitarize Japan by reforming its economy. Foreign observers as well as former officials in the imperial government emphasized the economic causes of the war. And when you read all the white papers from this time, they focused almost exclusively on this, which gives context to why the Allies allowed the Emperor to retain his title and position. 
In the decades since, there has been a reevaluation of the causes of the war that placed a greater emphasis on Japanese culture and the role of the emperor. But at the time, U.S. policymakers were very materialist in their views. And so, since economic causes were deemed to be the causes of the war, they thought if they could reform the economy of Japan, they could prevent future wars. The pre-war economy of Japan has been referred to as state monopoly capitalism. The economy was dominated by entities referred to as the Zaibatsu, best translated as financial clique. They were structured with a family-owned holding company at the top, which typically owned a bank, that would then loan money to other businesses owned by the holding company. Structures like this were illegal in most Western countries. The Zaibatsu-owned banks loaned money to their own family companies at artificially low interest rates and would charge exorbitant rates to outsiders. This meant that it was difficult for any business that wasn't part of a Zaibatsu to grow or compete in the economy. The Zaibatsu also tended to follow a rule known as the One Set Principle, which was a prohibition on diversifying a business. Each Zaibatsu stuck to one industry and avoided entering into others for fear of those entering into theirs. These resulted in each Zaibatsu becoming a monopoly dominating either an industry or a region of Japan. These Zaibatsu were owned by wealthy, well-connected noble families and would receive contracts from the government during times of war. Critics of the system believed that it created a perpetual cycle of wars, with the Zaibatsu always lobbying the government to invade new territory, which would necessitate more contracts to supply the military. As soon as the evidence against them had been compiled, Japan's war criminals were brought to trial. Number one on the list was the notorious wartime premier, General Hideki Tojo. Due to the tight relationship between the corporations and the government, the leaders of these corporations were also arrested as war criminals just like the military leaders. There would also be attempted land reforms. Of the changes the occupation has made in the Japanese way of life, none has met with greater success than its land reform. Land ownership in Japan had been concentrated into the hands of a small number of families, who either farmed the land themselves or rented it to tenant farmers. The Japanese Diet passed the Land Reform Act in 1945 in order to break up the large land holdings. Prior to the law, land was typically owned by families, not by individuals. The act made land ownership an individual right rather than a family one, and it capped land ownership at five acres. But at MacArthur's direction, the great estates were bought up by the government and resold to the farmers on liberal terms. This reform was not very successful because the large land-owning family simply divided up their land amongst the members of the family and continued to operate farms as whole units. Numerous provisions of this law were later repealed after Japan's new constitution came into effect, which protected private property rights. Many of the policies to reform the Japanese economy failed to revitalize it, and in fact caused more dislocation, and certainly were not helpful in combating the post-war inflation. The occupation government, as well as the U.S., ended this policy direction after 1948. Many of the business leaders that had been labeled as war criminals had this status removed and were allowed to return to their companies. The policies of breaking up the Zaibatsu were also curtailed. Originally, over 300 Zaibatsu had been targeted for liquidation by the occupation government, but after 1948, this was reduced to just 100. The formal Zaibatsu structure of a family-owned holding company owning banks and other businesses was legally ended, but the old relationships continued informally, which was a lot harder to regulate. Similar actions were taken with a lot of former government officials, being removed from the list of war criminals and being allowed to return to public service. The conservative government of Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida came into power after elections in 1949, and his ministry was focused on improving the economy rather than trying to reform society. He had to deal with inflation and unemployment, and he wanted to fight price inflation by increasing production. Steel and other metals were scarce, but the Japanese automobile industry was again in high gear, turning out trucks at a rate of 2,500 per month to help bolster the country's domestic economy. Since inflation is too much money chasing too few goods, if you increase production, you would have more goods for that money to chase. But you need more capital in order to increase production. Well, luckily for Japan, foreign affairs would provide just the opportunity. Japan is the key to the fate of the Far East. Once again, for the second time in the march of modern history, those words have urgent reality. But now, there is a difference in their meaning. In the late 1940s, the Americans became more acutely aware of communism's international reach. Numerous spy rings within the federal government were exposed, including high-ranking members of the Roosevelt administration. The point was emphasized further when Chiang Kai-shek's army fled to Taiwan, leaving Mao and the communists to take over the mainland in 1949. This was quickly followed up by North Korea's invasion of South Korea in 1950. 
America's Cold War foreign policy had been focused on Europe, and there were doubts over whether the United States would be willing to spend resources defending small, unimportant outposts like South Korea. But after China fell, those tiny outposts became a lot more important. The need to defend South Korea from communist aggression subsequently made Japan vastly more important. The military occupation of Japan is long since over now, but this is its fruit. It was an occupation without precedent in the history of the Orient and its results are likewise unparalleled. A strong, active friendship grows out of old enmities, a bond of mutual trust and goodwill ties together the people who once were the victors and those who were the vanquished. Japan became the hub for U.S. and U.N. operations in Korea, but they needed a lot of materials, and the closer they could obtain them to the front, the better. Well, the U.S. wasn't quite willing to let Japan produce weapons and munitions, but they were willing to let them produce textiles, food, and vehicles, all of which were in high demand. Many Japanese officials would refer to the Korean War as the divine wind for post-war Japan. It provided a much-needed stream of revenue for the cash-starved country and opened up markets in the U.S. After the war, President Eisenhower tried to keep up U.S. military spending in Japan, partly to reassure both Japan and South Korea that the U.S. wouldn't abandon them, but also to help fight communism within Japan by helping its economy recover. But despite efforts for democratic reform, many young Japanese idealists and intellectuals turn toward communism. In its struggle for control of the Japanese mind, the Communist Party of Japan directed its propaganda not only to critics of occupation and government policies, but to anyone dissatisfied with his lot. The Eisenhower administration wanted Japan to become an economic powerhouse in Asia, similar to West Germany and Europe. To do this, he needed to open up the rest of the world's economies to Japan, even if Japan wasn't going to do the same. You see, after World War II, free trade became one of the leading foreign policy goals of the United States. They believed that if they could solve the economic ills that they believed caused the war, that they could prevent future conflict. And they believed that free trade would be able to do this. And so the United States encouraged all of its allies to engage in free trade with each other. But there was some restrictions to this free trade that the United States wanted. The U.S. wanted its allies to trade with communist countries as little as possible. This meant cutting off trade with the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, North Korea, and most importantly for this story, China. During the Korean War, the U.S. banned the sale of certain commodities to China. America's European allies and Japan were both opposed to this measure, but the United States would sweeten the deal. In exchange for not trading with the communist countries, the U.S. would look the other way on protectionist policies that the Europeans and Japanese would place on American manufactured goods. At the time, this was a big ask of the U.S. government to its allies, especially when they were trying to promote free trade everywhere else. And to one extent or another, this is the deal that still exists between the United States and its allies today. This meant that while the U.S. had little to no restrictions on European or Japanese goods coming into the U.S., Europe and Japan were allowed to place tariffs on American goods in order to protect their own industries. The EU is not a free trade zone, but a customs union. They have all kinds of restrictions and tariffs on American goods, while the United States does not reciprocate. The same is also true of Japan. If you go to Japan today, you won't find very many foreign-made products. Aside from a few major food brands such as Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Starbucks, and KFC, you won't find much else. The same is true for American cars and electronics. Plenty of Toyotas in the U.S., but not nearly as many Fords or GMs in Japan. Many in the American business community would protest these conditions, but the political establishment of both the Republican and Democratic parties saw this as a small price to pay for American foreign policy. These conditions would become more controversial over time, especially after the U.S. extended diplomatic recognition to Communist China and opened up trade with them in later decades. So Cold War spending had helped pull Japan out of its post-war economic desperation. But by the late 1950s, economists, even those in the Japanese government, believed that the Japanese economic miracle was over. But there were some who believed that more could still be done. In the late 1950s, a Japanese economist, Osamu Shimomura, influenced by the theories of John Maynard Keynes, published Saikyo Sasaku no Kihon Mondai, Achieving Economic Growth which proposed fostering greater economic growth in Japan by stimulating private sector investment. Japan needed to move away from inexpensive exports that were dependent upon cheap labor and move toward more expensive consumer products such as cars and electronics. This required investing in manufacturing and overcoming their international reputation for cheap, low-quality goods. Shimomura's ideas found an adherent in Hayato Ikeda, 
Ikeda had been a finance minister in the Yoshida government, and won his own seat in the Diet in 1948, representing the Hiroshima Prefecture. He was seen as technocratic and unfriendly. Despite this, however, he continued to be appointed to cabinet positions, adding Minister of International Trade and Industry to his resume. He became the leader of the Liberal Democratic Party and then Prime Minister in 1960, after Nobusuke Kishi resigned in disgrace after the violence of the Anpo protests. Once in office, he unveiled an economic development plan inspired by Shimomura's work called the Economic Doubling Plan, with the goal of doubling the size of the economy as well as the average worker's income by stimulating private sector spending. He did this by passing tax cuts and having the Bank of Japan lower its interest rates. This freed up capital for companies to invest in new technology and better engineering. On top of that, his government also expanded infrastructure spending, building highways, high-speed rail, subways, airports, shipping docks, dams, and communications. Over the course of the 1960s, Japan's economy grew astronomically. As more of Japan's good entered the world market, its reputation for cheap, low-quality goods was gradually replaced with that of admiration for its quality and, in many cases, over-engineering. These policies received popular support, but not all was golden. Akita also wanted to open up Japan economically in order to improve competitiveness. He lowered tariffs and other restrictions on foreign investment, but received backlash from the protected industries. Japanese critics of the plan referred to trade liberalization as the second coming of the black ships, referring to Commodore Perry's fleet which opened up Japan over a century earlier. This growth would also attract negative attention in the United States and elsewhere, as the post-war economic boom ended in the early 1970s. Inflation combined with high unemployment tripped up government economists who had been operating under a Keynesian framework. This was made worse by the oil crisis of 1973, which hit Japan especially hard. The U.S. had domestic sources of oil, but Japan's primary source was the Middle East, and the sudden price increase disrupted the economic miracle, and depending on who you asked, ended it. The oil crisis resulted in a 20% decrease in production, which triggered inflation. Two more oil shocks hit Japan in 1978 and 79, but by the end of the decade, Japan had transitioned to an economy that focused on electronics and cars. The demand for fuel-efficient vehicles in the United States and Europe boosted Japanese exports, and high-quality consumer electronics were also in high demand as new media formats became available. Japan saw a second boom in the 1980s, but it was triggered by foreign pressures. The Reagan administration wanted to increase U.S. exports to Japan. To accommodate this, the Bank of Japan decided to lower interest rates in order to put more money into consumers' hands so they could buy foreign products. On top of this, a liberalization of stock trading laws gave companies access to new sources of funds. This meant that, this meant that manufacturers were borrowing less money from banks, which meant that banks needed to find new customers. And they did. Real estate speculators. Land values had always been on the high side in Japan. But after interest rates were lowered, land prices would begin to skyrocket, because there was nowhere else in Japan to invest. It's at this time that we also see a rise in wealthy Japanese businessmen buying up assets abroad. Mansions, golf courses, businesses, and other real estate. This led to a fear in the United States and elsewhere that Japan was a rising power once again and preparing to economically overtake America. There's no shortage of this messaging found in the late 70s through the 80s, but this second boom was, in fact, just a bubble. Despite the Bank of Japan's monetary easing policy, the Japanese weren't buying American-made products. And this was for two reasons. Protectionist policies and Japanese culture. Despite its economic revival in the 1960s, Japan's economy was still mostly closed off to outsiders. There were heavy restrictions on foreign persons or companies owning assets in Japan, as well as high tariffs placed on foreign manufactured goods. These policies resulted in the prices of goods being too high for the average Japanese person to afford. Those that could just went and purchased non-movable goods in the U.S. And then there were cultural issues. Since before the Second World War, Japan's economy was dependent on a steady flow of imported raw materials and a steady export of cheap goods. This basic model didn't change after the war and the miracle. They just swapped out cheap consumer goods with high-quality consumer electronics. But they were still dependent on foreign markets to buy their products. Domestically, the Japanese have a culture of high savings and low spending. Because of this, Japanese companies couldn't depend on domestic consumption for revenue. They depended on either the government or on foreigners. And despite the increase in consumer spending between the 1950s and 1980s, it wasn't enough to replace the dependency Japan had on exports. This meant that Japan's economy was vulnerable to economic conditions in other countries. Japan also had foreign competition for consumer electronics. You had the four Asian tigers, comprising South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. And by the 1990s, they had China to compete with as well. They thrived for so long by protecting themselves from foreign competition, 
but after a certain point, protectionism ceases to be effective. Modern Japan is a strange hybrid of high-tech efficiency and Luddite backwardness. The bureaucracy is Byzantine, requiring absurd amount of paperwork for basic things that in Western countries you wouldn't need any permission for. And you need even more paperwork if you're a foreigner living and working in Japan. They still use fax machines and require every meeting at any level of importance to be done in person. They are very risk-averse and afraid of trying new things. They were obsessed with hardware but didn't get going on software until after American companies were able to establish themselves as the global standard. Physical media such as Blu-rays, magazines, and CDs are still preferred over digital or streaming. It's a culture of avoiding uncomfortable situations, which allows old systems to fester. Their educational system and work culture pushes its citizens to the point of mental and physical collapse, leading some to become the despised neets or hikikomoris. I recommend listening to the Trash Taste podcast to learn more about life in modern Japan. It's kind of nuts. But let's bring this story back to the Cold War. By the early 90s, the speculator bubble in Japan had burst, and the USSR was no more. The very things the US wanted from Japan, to be an economic powerhouse capable of resisting communism, had been achieved. But many of these very policies resulted in the very long slump Japan has been in since the end of the Cold War. Some of these consequences were foisted on them by outsiders, but just as many, if not more, were natively grown. What happened afterwards is a story for another time. This video is part of Project MAD, so don't forget to check out the other videos in the playlist. And thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Click the top link in the description to get a free trial. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.